Hi, this is Dr. Sayyid Junaid and today we'll be talking about neck of femur hip fractures. This is one of the fractures that as a medical student you really have to know a fair bit about. Neck of femur fractures are a pretty common fracture and they are actually a source of quite a great bit of morbidity and mortality in the patient cohort. In fact, uh, there's even a 10% mortality rate in the first month of all patients who have a hip fracture. When you say hip fracture, you're referring to neck of femur fractures in particular. And the reason being that this patient cohort uh, has plenty of comorbidities. Your typical patient is going to be an elderly patient who has osteoporosis and with minimal force ends up breaking their hip, hip bone, i.e. the neck of femur. And it could be male or female, it particularly tends to be female more than male simply because of the rate of osteoporosis is greater at, a, at an elderly age. And also the fact that these patients will have, as we mentioned, comorbidities such as cardiac disease, renal, respiratory abnormalities, and it may be an unmasking of something else. For example, uh, I've seen a patient who had an MI, as a result fell off and broke their hip. So you really need to actually make sure that you see this patient as a holistic uh, entity, and breaking of the hip may just be a small thing and managing the patient as a whole is much, much more important. Broadly speaking, hip fractures are classified as intracapsular or extracapsular, and being able to distinguish this is actually quite an important point, as a result because of the management is entirely different. If we take this intratrochanteric line of this hip, a fracture above this is considered as intracapsular, a fracture including this line or below is extracapsular, so here's an example of intracapsular, and here's an example of extracapsular. As you can see, that this is the intertrochanteric line, and this fracture has taken place below it. A fracture including the intertrochanteric line is also considered as extracapsular. Now, why this distinguishing point, and why does the management differ? In order to fully appreciate this, we need to look at the anatomy of the blood supply of the head of the femur. The main supply of the head of the femur actually comes from the circumflex artery, the lateral and the medial, which are the branches of the femoral artery here. There is a smaller supply from the ligamentum teres, but which is pretty small and it's irrelevant uh, in majority if, if this blood supply is actually disrupted. So if a patient, for example, gets a fracture, say, in the middle of the neck of the femur, this blood su supply will be disrupted. And as a result, the patient will develop uh, the complication which we all dread, called avascular necrosis. Now, if this patient develops avascular necrosis of the femoral head, this femoral head will look something like a shriveled up piece of bone, which will not be able to support the actual joint itself, and the hip will become useless. However, if the fracture takes place in the trochanteric line, or below, this supply of blood is usually, remember usually, not always, is maintained and as a result the patient will not develop avascular necrosis. Hence the management is different. Management of patients who have had a neck of femur fracture which is intracapsular, you will need to replace this femoral head. As, pardon me. You will need to replace that femoral head whereas if it's below that other things can be done such as putting a screw in which we'll talk about in a later slide. So as a medical student or a junior doctor you're asked how will you manage a patient with a neck of femur fracture. You first want to mention that you'll take a thorough history. Uh, you want to ascertain whether the patient has any comorbidities, uh, whether what type of fall it was, was it a mechanical fall or was it a there was there a medical reason why the patient fell. Perhaps the patient as I mentioned earlier had a NMI or they had a seizure and as a result fell over, or was an unknown fall which was undocumented and unwitnessed. Are there any, any medication the patient's on? Perhaps they're on antihypertensives uh, which have dropped the patient's blood pressure, caused the patient postural hypertension, as a result the patient fell. Uh, you want to know the patient's previous mobility. Uh, this will determine the aggressiveness of the treatment that the patient receives. Uh, were they what sort of aids they were using, were they using a crutches in a frame or were they fully mobile and what is the home situation, do they have stairs at home, who looks after them, are they fully independent, do they have carers.
Next, you want to do a full examination of the patient. Uh, this includes a cardiovascular, abdominal, respiratory and neurological examination, which goes, goes without saying. But a few things you will want to look out for in a patient who's got a broken hip. A hip fracture is that the patient will probably not be able to straight leg raise because there will be a lot of pain, uh, which is what SLR stands for here. And the other thing that you will notice is that the affected leg will be shortened and externally rotated. And the reason being is we can, if we just look at this uh, slide here, can we, you can see that the lesser trochanter has moved up and the, the function of the opposing muscles have caused the leg to rotate. And there's a small diagram just to remind you uh, of what happened to the leg and things to look out for. So if you're examining, make sure you mention that and look out for that the leg is shortened and externally rotated. In the acute management of a patient with hip fracture, the most important thing initially to do is to ensure the patient is adequately resuscitated. Uh, the hip is a highly vascular bone and patients may have lost significant amount, amount of blood, so you want to replace their volume. Initially, this may be in the form of normal saline uh, and they may also go on to need uh, cross-matched blood. Analgesia is quite important because this is a highly painful uh, fracture. Uh, this is usually in the form of opioid-based analgesics, but patients may also benefit from a local nerve block. Getting x-rays uh, is quite important. Make sure you get uh, AP and lateral x-rays, and ideally you also want an x-ray of the joint above and below if any of any traumatic injury. Uh, also getting a chest x-ray in patients who are above the age of 65 is also helpful. Getting an ECG helps to not only rule out any non uh, mechanical causes of the patient falling, but also prepares the patient for theatre. It's something that the anaesthetist will want to know. The fact that these, these factors tend to happen in a cohort of patients who have got a lot of multiple comorbidities, DVT prophylaxis is quite important. Uh, the f they will become, as a result of this fracture, initially anyway, uh, bed bound, and which will increase the risk of developing deep vein thrombosis. So putting patients on low molecular weight heparins uh, is quite important. And this will be in the form of, for example, clexane, which is also, which also known as enoxaparin, teldoparin, or depending on the hospital policy that you have, heparins uh, in some in hospitals still used. Other things that patients may benefit from are thromboembolic and deterrent stockings, TED stockings. If you ever asked a question on management in any surgical speciality, the answer will always be conservative and surgical. Conservative management for hip fracture is not really the option uh, in most patients because it, it means the patient will be bed bound f for six to eight weeks with analgesia and uh, perhaps even a splint such as a Thomas splint. So this is not really viable and patients who have got a lot of comorbidities will get worsened. For example, they will develop uh, pressure sores. If they've got limited mobility in the first place, they may even forget to walk, as they say, particularly in the dementia a cohort of patients. So the main option is actually surgical and we'll go on to how this is possible. So firstly we'll consider the intracapsular fractures i.e. the ones who are above or after the intertrochanteric line. Now there's a classification called Gardner's classification uh, and I've drawn them here 1, 2, 3 and 4 but the important thing to take away is actually whether the fragment which is the uh, which is the, it's always to do with the distal fragment is it displaced from or not. So if, if, as we can see here, the garden 1 and 2 aren't actually displaced, whereas garden 3 and 4 are displaced. Now if you rec recall the anatomy that we've just talked about of the vasculature, if the fragment is displaced, there's a high risk of disrupting that blood flow uh, compared to if it's not displaced.